to the First United Church of Christ in Richmond, Michigan's online service for 2 May 2021. The name of our sermon today from Pastor Katie Daly is Others. So we hope to see you in church. If not, uh, you're online here. And as the pandemic loosens its grip, we hope to see everyone in church sooner than later. Bye-bye. Good morning, everybody, and first of all, I would like to wish a happy Easter to all of our Orthodox friends who are celebrating Easter today, and I want to remind everybody out there on Cyberland, this is Communion Sunday. If you need to go into your kitchen and grab your elements for communion, do so now so that you will be ready, and here we are. It is the fifth Sunday of Easter already. Hard to believe. Let us begin. An iron worker was nonchalantly laboring on the dangerous crossbeams of a new skyscraper. And the clatter below didn't seem to bother him, nor the sounds of the city. When he came down at the end of his shift, an onlooker looked amazed and expressed and questioned, how are you able to get up there and do that demanding job? And it's so noisy. How do you do that? And his answer was, well, I used to drive a school bus, but my nerves gave out. <laughs> so at this time, I would like to welcome Devin, who's going to welcome us to our worship today. Hi, I am Devin Smith. Thank you, Dad. Price is my dad, and I want to thank him for the prelude. Just a reminder, a hard copy of the worship can be found on our webpage. Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to pray with us this weekend. God is still speaking. Let us listen. We are a priesthood of all believers, and we are come as you are church, and everyone is welcome here. You are welcomed here as one who is made in the image and likeness of God to come and see. We are glad you have come to this journey with us, and we give thanks to our God for putting us on the same path. Welcome to our time of prayer, praise, and worship on this fifth Sunday of Easter. Thank you for being in the presence with us as we pray. Now for the ringing of the bell. We light this candle to remind us that Christ is the light of the world, and we are Christ's light in the world. Amen. God dwells in you. When you feel God's love, don't hide it. It should shine from your heart and give light to everyone around you. The more love you give, the more love you will receive. It is the fifth Sunday of Easter, and our readings are on our webpage. We are going to be, it will be Acts 
uh, chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. First of John, chapters four, chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. And John, chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. As we gather, may we open our hearts to receive the newness of life. In our time of worship, may we be inspired by God's wisdom. Come, let us worship as the beloved children of God. Cultivating God, we come as your children to grow and learn because you are our divine vine grower. God, we desire you to abide within us and for your grace to be revealed anew daily. As your branches, we ask you to nourish us for continued growth. May you transform our hearts and minds as we hear your word, sing your praises, and engage in holy dialogue through your prayer. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Devin. And now we will sing all people that on earth do dwell. In our prayer of illumination before the scriptures. Gracious God, illumine these words by your spirit that we might hear what you would have us hear and be who you would have us be. For the sake of Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. Amen. And I invite Hope to come forward for the readings. <coughs> first reading is from Luke, Acts, chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. Then the angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. 
This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen, is, queen of Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and asked, so Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb, silent before its shearer. So he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom May I ask you, does the prophet say this about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop. And both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the town until he came to Caesarea. Our second reading is from the first letter of John, chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit and we have seen and do testify that the father has sent his son as the savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe that the love that God has for us, God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been, sorry, God Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, 
I love God and hate their brother or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you so much, Hope. It's a last minute, because somebody has COVID. The gospel reading is from John. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. And such branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please stand for sweet, sweet spirit. Today, too, it's going to be the same. So, 
There was an elderly preacher, and he was asked to do some things, and he put it on his calendar, but it was a good thing he had a wife, because she was the only one that remembered about all the things he was supposed to do. And on this one afternoon, it was a Saturday, and he was all set to sit around and watch the Tigers play ball, and his wife came in and says, did you remember that you said you would go down and do an invocation for the Boy Scouts? He's like, oh man, I wanted to just sit here and have a beer and watch the game and be lazy. And she said, I'm not about to make an excuse for you. So sure enough, he goes and he goes down to where the field is and there's a great big hill and he looks down and all the Scouts are down there. I have to go all the way down there and I have to come all the way back up the hill. So he does what anybody who's prone to laziness would do. He yells down, hey, you guys, come on up here. So they all come up and they gather around him. And he reaches by a tree and he grabs a branch. He breaks it off. He said, see this? It's no longer connect connected to that. And he said, for all of you boys out there, I want you to know, if you don't stay connected to Jesus, you're going to dry up just like this branch is when I leave it sitting here. Have a good day. That was the end of his invocation for the kids. Well, it wasn't too long after that that he gets a phone call from a mother, and she says, I just want to thank you. And he's like, I don't know who you are, and I don't know what you're thanking me for, but she goes on to say, she said, my son was at the Boy Scout gathering when you came to talk to the boys. And she says, I want you to know that it was because of what you had to say that he came home and he said to his parents, hey, it's time we got back into the habit of going to church. It's really important or we're going to dry up. And she said, from that day on, we made it a point to always get to worship every Sunday. And when he came home, he said you had a very, very short message, and that's pretty much all it was. And he's listening on the other end of the phone, and she said, it wasn't but six months later that we found out our son had a serious disease. And we had a funeral last week. And she said, I can't thank you enough for the fact that he came home from that Boy Scout outing and we became connected to Jesus again because of your message. So one never knows what little thing will lead somebody back into the worship and being community with other people. Even a lazy pastor who didn't want to be there on a Saturday afternoon, I am sure he walked away from there just glad to go watch the game and didn't think his words really fell on anybody's ears. Just proves, though, we never know how somebody's going to hear what you have to say and take it home. That young man actually evangelized his parents, got them back in step with the Lord. So we come together and we gather and you know it's a communal celebration. It's so important for us that we gather to pray together, that we hear music, and we hear pretty much dancing music around here, so we get a little bit more peppy. And it's important, too, that we share the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the cup with one another on a regular basis, because that's what keeps us connected to our Lord and to each other. And in church, not right now, but at other times when everybody feels free to come to worship, you know, sometimes we're sitting by family members, and other times we might be sitting next to a perfect stranger. But we come because we want to do this in communion with each other. Now, in the reading that you heard today, you know that there's somebody who always has to be an encourager in your life, and somebody else who helps you understand the scriptures. We open up the book of scriptures at home, and 
I don't know about all of you, but sometimes I read it and I, hear some, I see something totally new than I've ever seen before. But I know that when I open the book, when I pray first, that God's going to make me see something that I haven't seen there before. So in Paul, you notice our readings in the Easter season are all from the New Testament, the Christian scriptures. We get nothing from the Hebrew scriptures at this time. So we know that with Paul, now let me ask you, he was the one that went around and persecuted all the Christians. And then all of a sudden, he has this experience of God on the road to Damascus and comes back to the group and says, I'm a changed man. How hard would it be for you to accept him? He was the one that persecuted anybody who believed in Jesus Christ as Lord. So it would be very hard. You know, it's no different than somebody in our community that we might know has been really awful at times, and they're away for a while, and they come back, and they're different. Or somebody goes on one of those weekend retreat things, and somehow God works in their life at that time, and not only do you hear them say that they've been changed, but you can see in everything about them that they have a new spark in their eyes. They have something else going on inside of them. And that was what happened with Paul. He comes back, and of course, the 11 that are there are saying, yeah, uh-huh, we're supposed to welcome you with open arms. You who've been persecuting all of us who believe in Jesus as Lord. So finally, one of the followers, Barnabas, he kind of says, I believe in you. I believe people can change because of Jesus. I believe you've changed. And so Barnabas was the one who went to the others and said, you know, we need to give him a chance. We need to understand that things can happen because of Jesus and people can change. You know, that's what church is about, changing people. We're all sinners. Paul was really a bad one, being that he was that persecutor of all the Christians. And with Jesus, he goes from being the persecutor to the preacher. And he goes and starts all these churches all over the place. And the Corinthian church was the one that he had to write to the most because they kept falling out of step. And that's why you have a little bit more of the writings to the Corinthians. But Paul, who was the persecutor, became Paul the preacher. And then we have that wonderful story about the eunuch. He's sitting under the tree and he's reading the scriptures out loud. Because that's what you did then. You didn't read it just to yourself in your mind. You read it out loud. And then Philip comes by. And how come Philip was there? We don't know. He just happened to come by and he hears him reading. And he says, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch says, um, I'm, I'm just reading the words. I, I could use some help. I could use some help. How nice would it be if all of us who, when we look and read anything, would say, I need a little bit of help understanding this. What were the circumstances of the time? Just like he's, he's sitting there by a tree and he's reading out loud. Now, I've been caught in the circumstance where I'm just reading words sometimes, and when you're reading just the words with nothing going on inside of your head, you will sometimes mispronounce words because you're just reading text, you're not paying too much attention. And so Philip says, sure, no problem. I will sit down and we will read the scriptures together. And then, of course, the eunuch says, I like these words, I believe in these words. You know, there's some water down there. Do you think I could be one of those baptized followers? And Philip says, yes. And they go right down. And he gets baptized. 
You notice that it was immediate because he asked for it. He said, I want that. I want to be claimed as somebody who is baptized in the name of Jesus the Christ. I believe in that story. I believe in that person. And I want to be identified as one of the baptized. Note, he didn't have to go to school. He didn't have to go for lessons. He had to just have the question and ask. And so many times we're hung up on, did somebody finish a book, a chapter, or whatever, before we say, oh, yes, you can be baptized. When in the scriptures, anytime someone is baptized, all they do is ask to be baptized. They ask, and they're taken to the water or to the font. And so you have the story of Barnabas, who is the encourager, and Philip, who helps understand. Now, who are the people in your life that are the encouragers and the people who help you understand the scriptures? Think about who they might be. Every one of us probably went to some kind of faith formation when we were kids, and that was before we had questions. And as good as all of those programs are, there's a tendency when a program ends that the learning goes right out the walls, you know, it just goes down the tubes because they didn't have the questions first. And a couple of weeks ago, I alluded to a young man who was in here uh, on Good Friday. And he was asking questions just about everything in here. I mean, he was very inquisitive. I don't recall what his age was exactly, probably close to 10 years of age. But he basically, he looked around and he said, well, tell me about that window. So I told him about that window. And then he asked about the middle windows, the circular ones here, on each side. And then he walked over to the font and he said, what's that thing there? So I opened it and he says, well, what happens there? And so I explained it to him, and he said, well, am I going to be able to do that someday? I don't think I've ever been taken there. So that young man probably went home, and he's going to be an evangelizer to his parents. He's going to say, I learned about the windows, I saw things, I asked some questions, let me tell you about it, and there's this thing, there's this place there, and I want to do that. When he had the questions, he heard the answers. And in our scriptures, we know that there is the vine and the branches. And if you picture any pictures you've seen of grapes, and we have one there, you notice that they don't just scatter all over the ground. You know why? Because then you get all these little growths that are coming up, and they don't have the strength. That's why they have to be lifted up on the trellis. So they're lifted up, and the air flows under them, and the sunshine can come in and ripen the grapes. And even if today, the other day when it was raining when I was here, you know what dandelions do in the rain. They just close up and wither. You'd swear they were dead. If I were to grab one of those on my way in today, I want you to know that by now it would be totally limp and lifeless because it was not any longer attached to the root. So it's so important as you evangelize people in your life, when you say why being in community is important to you, you are an evangelizer. What do people talk about most today? Not about the scriptures. It's did you have your shot? What kind did you get? When did you get it? How long ago? And are you still masked? And are you safe? So evangelize about the things that really matter in the personal lives of the people that you are related to or the people that you see once in a while, don't be afraid to talk to them. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Abide, stay with me. Everything's going to be okay. And don't we fret over just the craziest things at times? You know, things that we have absolutely no control over anyhow. And if we could just give it to God. Just give it to God, because after, after all, who's in charge? You know, so if we look at those stories and remember that there was an encourager, 
and a teacher. So great stories to just remember as we think about church and who's here and who's not here and who you haven't seen, who we haven't seen since the pandemic. Everybody's being careful, but maybe you run into them at Kroger's or someplace, but there's probably some people we haven't seen for a while. You know, make a phone call. That's all. It takes just a phone call to say, hey, how you doing? Where you been? And then there's going to be people, once this whole pandemic is over, people will have gotten very close to just sitting at the computer and watching church, and it's very comfortable. So things will have changed because of the pandemic, but some of the things that will have changed will enable more people to be at worship, you know, because our online experience is far greater than our in-person has ever been, not just now, but ever. And so people will go to whatever satisfies their need at that time, but they need to have an invite. You know, and they need to be reminded, too, that, you know, if you haven't been around here at our church for a long time, you need to touch base. And you know, it matters not who the pastor is or who the preacher is. And everybody doesn't even have to like the pastor. What matters is you. You are the community. You have homes in the area. You make it a point to always be connected to each other. You know who's not sitting here today who was usually here. Matter of fact, we have someone else sitting in Doris Ann's seat today. So we know that no matter what, she made it a point to get to church and my gosh, did she light up a, like a Christmas tree anytime those twins were with her at church? I mean, she just was like all sparkly when those boys were with her. And so we need to be the evangelizers. We need to be the ones who will say, hey, I'm going to stand by you. I can do this. And for the people who only come to church because of a pastor, they need to be reminded, you, you don't come because of the pastor or the preacher, and you know, sometimes we're going to have visiting pastors in. You come because of each other. And you, you hope, and I know this is very truthful, you are hoping that the person standing up here doesn't go on too long and has at least one thing that you can take home with you. And that's it. That is basically where you're coming from. And Kim, I just want you to know, I did not forget the Our Father today. I'm including it as part of the communion rite. I know that's one of the things that she has always said, that it's very important for her to pray the prayer together. So some of the things that we usually do prior to this point will be inclusive as we go into the communion rite. And the people said... Heavenly Father, merciful God, powerful and wonderful, eternally present and gracious, we are grateful for what you have given us in Jesus Christ. We have life and love, and you have given us your spirit, and we are encouraged by the spirit and by your faithfulness. We lift up our cares and concerns of our hearts, the burdens and the worries of all of our lives. And we pray that the sick would be healed, that the broken will be mended, that the mournful will be comforted. And we pray that warriors yield to peace that leaders will gain wisdom, that the forsaken would be gathered in. We pray that the sorrowful are consoled, that the poor would be lifted up, and the anxious would be released. We pray for children in their growing and for youth in their seeking. We pray for those making new starts and for those nearing the journey's end. 
We pray for those facing hard choices and for those enduring painful consequences. We pray for those filled with bitterness and for those who are just empty. We pray that your church might claim its potential, that the body of Christ might be strengthened by its many parts, and that the work of ministry might be done with joy and thanksgiving. We pray for the courage to follow Jesus, for the faith to trust your promises to us, and for the vision to see your kingdom among us even now. We pray for all that you would have us pray for. We pray for those for whom no one prays. We pray all these things in the name of the one carelessly praying with us, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. And at this time, we just remind anybody who is interested in participating in the church in any way, shape, or form, or financially, we now have a button on the uh, YouTube and Facebook for donations. But it's just a reminder that this is a way to connect to Jesus Christ, our vine. In other words, we are to bear fruit with the spirit of love by helping each other and reaching out to each other and encouraging each other as they make their pilgrimage of faith. As it is written in the Wisdom Book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, two are better than one because if they fall, one will lift up the other. But for the one who is alone and falls, there is not another to lift that person up. So let our offering lift up one another in God's love that abides in times of sadness, loss, and grief. Let our offering lift up one another in God's love that abides in times of hopelessness, brokenness, and failure. Let our offering be a thanksgiving of God's love that abides within us in times of hope. So we have hopefulness, forgiveness, and unity, and peace. That peace that every one of you kind of exchanged as you walked into the building today. You are definitely the church. So we, let, we accept God's invitation to be ever-present in our times of despair and in our times of joy. So we offer in gratitude and generosity as fruits representing the abiding presence and goodness of God. We give thanks for all of those who have generously participated online, those who continue to support, remembering that we do this as the body of Christ. And our prayer over our offerings is, Generous God, we offer you the fruits of our time, talents, and resources in celebration of all that we have been given. Loving God, we give you all the thanks for the special blessings on the fruits of our community here, right here in Richmond. May the gifts nourish and strengthen this community and your extended communities to grow spiritually, emotionally, and physically. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And now we move to the time of our Lord's Supper. Now let us prepare our hearts as we get ready to share at the Lord's table. Search me, O God, know my heart. 
see if there is any destructive way in me. Remove what is not of you and cast it into the sea of forgetfulness as far as east is from west so that it may never return again. Holy Spirit, you are my strength. Holy Spirit, do thy will in the mighty, majestic, holy, magnificent, awesome, healing, powerful name of Jesus, we pray and the people of God say, Amen. We are forgiven simply because of the love of God. Let us go through our confession. Almighty and most merciful Father, we come before you acknowledging our sins, our shortcomings, and our breaking of covenant with you and each other, even making promises and breaking promises. Not only have we done these things we ought not to have done and things we ought not to have said and left undone the very things we ought to have done, but we have been silent when we should have witnessed for you. Not only are we guilty of that, O oh Lord, but we have closed our eyes and pretended to not see injustices, racism, and evils that pervade our lives each day we have shut our ears and pretended, pretended not to hear the cries for liberation which come from the lips and lives and hearts of the oppressed, even of our friends, brothers and sisters. Forgive us, O oh Lord. Renew our courage and our faith and keep us ever mindful of thy great sacrifice. Hear us, we beseech thee, as we come to you in love and worship, giving your name the praise forevermore. We have confessed our sins collectively as a family as a village. And the question is often asked, how are we forgiven? Why are we forgiven? Is it because we attend church? That is not the basis of forgiveness. Is it because we have some letters behind our name? No, there is something unique and special in our tradition known as grace. Grace is a powerful idea. It means unmerited, unwarranted, acts of love coming from God. That God intervenes in our lives, not because we've checked off some boxes and we're, quote, good people, but God intervenes and God grants forgiveness because of grace. It is that God loves us and pours God's love into us, around us, and through us. Not because of our worth, but because we are God's creation. For God so loved the world that God gave God's only begotten Son, that whosoever believe shall not perish, but have everlasting life. This is an act of grace. Our tradition is a whosoever tradition. It's not based on who you are, 
not based on your location, geography, ethnicity, creed, gender, or orientation. It is a whosoever tradition that we all have the imprint of divine grace on us. We have confessed our sins corporately. We recognize we are forgiven because of grace. Let us go to God in prayer this moment as we prepare in this holy meal. Let us pray the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory. Amen. As we bow our heads, O oh, great God of grace and love, we thank you for this holy meal of bread and wine that reminds us, reminds us of the sacrifice of Jesus, who is the Christ. We have the elements that we use for Eucharist. We have our fellowship cups, and I didn't think it was fair to use other than the fellowship cup for me. I'm using exactly what we all use. So we are reminded that this is the body of Christ, the bread representing the body in our elements and the juice in our instance, God's love. We thank you, O oh God. Forgive us for the rebellion and acts of not lifting fitting for your grace. In the wonderful, mighty name of Jesus, we pray. We pray that your Holy Spirit go over our gifts and those that we hold in our hands. We have come this day to partake in this holy meal. As Jesus gathered with his disciples, those who were following him, all of them, he took the bread broke it. And at this moment, you can take the cellophane off your package and take and eat. And now you take this other top off. Likewise, the cup of wine after the meal, the cup symbolizing the blood that was shed for the redemption of all. Take and drink. pray our prayer of thanksgiving. Lord, thank you for this holy meal. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have been blessed. We have returned and been renewed and remembered the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. This is our faith, that we celebrate communion together. So we thank you, God, for this opportunity to come together, to pray, to have this holy meal. We pray for all of those who are in cyberland, and all of those who, for whatever reason, have not found a community of faith as yet. 
Let us go forth thankful that we have come. Let us go forth renewed in God's abiding love. And let us go forth rejoicing in the good news of Jesus Christ, whose love will never let us go. Amen. Please stand for, set forth by God's blessing.